Make sure I can click that real quick. There we go. Thanks. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. If I have not met you yet, my name is Tim Alsop. I'm the minister, one of the ministers at the Great Oaks Church of Christ in Memphis, Tennessee. I've been there about 17 years. Uh, it's my first time to be here at the Connect Conference. I've heard good things about it, and I love the emphasis, as I'm sure you do here. You do also, since you're here. Um, and I'm excited to be part of this. Appreciate you being here for this session, uh, Building an Evangelistic Church Culture. I love this topic. I hope it'll be an encouraging one. Um, I'll do my best with it. Let me say a few things about it before we jump into it. Uh, like a lot of things you talk about, I don't take this topic because I feel like I'm an expert in any particular way. Uh, it's something I believe in. It's something I feel like I've seen at different points in my life, at different places. You probably have too. Um, and it's something that I guess I've had the chance semi-recently to really dig into. Uh, so this last spring, I finished a dissertation, and the dissertation topic that I worked on was evangelism in post-Christian cultures. And I don't know that I like that terminology for our culture. If you know a better one, I'm happy to to listen to it, but people are calling our culture and other Western cultures post-Christian. What they mean by that is Christianity used to be the center of everything, and now it's not. So how do you evangelize in a culture that sort of feels like it's past Christianity? How do you reach out in that type of place? And so uh, what I found was everyone's been asking that question for 30 years or more, and there's all these writings and surveys and stuff that people have done. So the backbone of what I got to dig into was I just want to see what are people finding. And again, this isn't just something we're asking in Churches of Christ. This is you know, A lot of people are asking those same questions and fighting those same battles. How do you reach out in that type of culture? I identified six things uh, that, that I found to be biblically faithful. You can, as you can imagine, there's a few things that I thought, well, I don't think that's the best way to do it in light of Scripture. Uh, but I found six things, and one of the things that is a common theme as people are trying to figure out how to reach out in our culture is this is church culture, that, that, that it's bigger than just an individual, um, that we need to think of evangelism not just as you evangelizing and not just as me evangelizing, but as us evangelizing. And I like that concept. I think that's very biblical, and we'll dig into that. So what I want to do today, I'll just share some of the things I found in that study, uh, maybe some of the things I've seen along the way that I feel like maybe support some of that stuff, and I hope it'll be good. As we go through it, um, I, I, when I was in here earlier, uh, with Keith, what he said, I'll say the same thing. If you see anything that you, you want to, hey, stop, what, is that, what does that mean? Uh, ask a question. We can even toss out a question to the group. I'm open to this being whatever you want it to be. Um, so stop me if you'd like to as we go along through it. Let me start with this. How important is culture? The idea of culture has become a buzzword in business and sports and everything else. And the idea, of course, is that when you get groups of people together, there's often a personality that the group takes on in itself. And if the culture is right, if the personality of the group is right, there's a multiplying factor there. And so sometimes people talk about, well, what about culture versus strategy? And there's a guy named Peter Drucker, who I believe is in the business world, who really started about talking about this idea of culture. And the phrase he said that people quote all the time, he said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And what he means by that is strategy is good, and, you know, as you're trying to build something. But if you can make those strategy things who you really are, that's even more powerful. Like that, That's an even bigger deal, and that's just who we are. And so, obviously, that would be a goal for evangelism. If we can, strategy is good to get us going. It's good to, to help us add things that we haven't been doing. But if you can make it who you really are, that's even more powerful. And there's a multiplying aspect there. Uh, this is probably something you've experienced. Uh, if you've ever been to a, to a church camp, of a, of, of a group, and you just felt like the spirit of the whole week was, was encouraging to follow Jesus. And what you found during the week that people were just, you know, I, I need to take a step of faith in my life. And there wasn't anything in particular, like there wasn't a moment or anything, but it was just the whole week. That's what the spirit was all about. Or a, or a mission trip that you've been on. And maybe just the whole week, there was just a, a spirit about it. And I don't know that churches could replicate that 52 weeks a year. But you'd like to think churches should be able to approximate that a little bit, that, that we're really trying to follow Jesus here. And you'd like to think that when people who aren't Christians or people who have been out of faith for a while, 
I'd like to think as they come in that they could sense that this is really a group of people who are trying to follow Jesus. You've probably been to churches that you felt like, it felt like that. It felt like that people were excited to be here and they're enjoying life together and they're trying to follow God and it made you want to be stronger. Um, it's probably something you've seen a little bit. Think about when you invite someone. And again, we're just starting with how important is culture and then I'll, I'll tick off some points here. Uh, when you invite someone to church, if you want to use that phrase, uh, let's say you, you're talking to a neighbor, a coworker, and you're, you start having conversations about faith, and they don't, they're not Christians, and you finally get up the nerve to invite them to come to church with you. What do you hope is going to happen when they, when they come in the door? I, I think what you, let me just list some things that I think you hope are going to happen. I think you hope people are going to talk to them, right? <laughs> you hope they're not going to be ignored the whole time they're there. Uh, you hope that they're going to see that this is a group of people that, has a life to them that, you know, they don't feel like it's just cold and, and empty and don't want to be here. Uh, you'd like the preacher to talk about the Bible in a way that's going to challenge people, but not sound like a jerk as he does it, you know, that sort of thing. Like there, there's, there's things that you hope happen and there's things you hope don't happen. You hope people don't ignore them. You hope people don't seem mean. You, you hope people don't feel like it's just dead and cold. That, that's a culture element because you realize intuitively I want this person to see the goodness of Christianity. And for them to see the goodness of Christianity, they need to see it in all of us. Not just me talking to them uh, in our neighborhood. They need to see it in all of us. And then one more thing. Um, the reason people talk so much about church culture when it comes to evangelism and discipleship, as we're talking about in this conference, it's real difficult. Let's say you get really good and effective at personal evangelism. And I hope we're all trying to grow in our effectiveness in, in personal evangelism. Let's say you get effective at it and, and you bring someone to Jesus. That transition from you to a church can be a really difficult one, can it? If, the, if there's not a church alongside you that has a culture that's really encouraging faith. And we've probably all seen that, where, where someone has been baptized into Christ and became a Christian. Well, well, being part of a church family, that's part of God's goal for our life, isn't it? That's, that's how you grow and where you grow. And it's not always the church's fault. That, that that transition doesn't go well. I'm not suggesting that. Um, Jesus told the parable of the soils where if there's going to be some who, who commit to it and then as soon as it's difficult, they, they decide they don't really want to do this. That, that stuff's going to happen. But the best possible environment for a new Christian is, is it when there's a good culture, when there's a group of people all together that are really trying to follow God. And so culture is important. And let me share... A couple verses before we get into my points here. A couple verses that I think are culture verses that connect with evangelism. So this is John 13, 34 and 35. Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's a culture verse right there, isn't it? If you all care about each other as Christians, people will see that that's a connection to Jesus Christ. That's a connection to me, Jesus says. Uh, there's a guy that had been at Great Oaks with us in Memphis and, um, and went, moved to Oklahoma to preach. And uh, he, was, he moved to this congregation. He was just getting to know the congregation. And they'd had, they had some struggles along the way. And, and so we were talking on the phone about how's it going. And one of the things he said was, he said, I feel like we need to work on us first before we really start reaching out to the community. And I thought there was some wisdom in that to say that, you know what, let's make sure we are who we should be before we bring anybody in. What he's intuitively feeling is there's a culture element to growing in faith. And so this is a culture statement. If you love each other, I hope people can come into our congregations and see that we genuinely care about each other. And I hope that you and I can lead the way in that and trying to produce a culture of caring about people in our congregations. Another passage that I think is a culture passage is that first church in Jerusalem in Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And, and what I notice here, you'll see the love element again that Jesus talked about, but there's also this commitment element that's just really impressive in this, in this congregation. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. They're devoting themselves. They are all in on following the apostles' teaching. They love to be together. They love to worship together. They're feeling a sense of awe. There's the spirit about being together. Uh, God's doing wonders through the apostles. Look at verse 44. 
All those who had believed were together. They had all things in common. You remember they're sacrificing for each other. They're selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, they're together with one mind in the temple. They're breaking bread from house to house. So they're together publicly in the big temple meeting area. They're meeting each other's homes. They're taking their meals together. And guess what's happening in verse 47? They're growing. People are becoming Christians. And it's not surprising to us. Because if you, you see their commitment, you see how much they love God and love each other, it's not surprising that, that this type of committed Christianity produced evangelism opportunities. And so again, I hope our church families can show a real commitment of trying to follow Jesus Christ. If we do, there's a multiplying element. It's not just you, and it's not just me, and it's not just individuals, but all of us are trying to follow the Lord. I think you see that in Acts 2 also. So here's what I want to do with the rest of our time. It's okay with you. Uh, I've got four things that you will find in evangelism writings uh, that I think that I find to be biblically faithful, uh, that I think are things uh, we need to try to incorporate into our church families to try to have an evangelistic culture where it's not just you reaching out, not just me reaching out, but it's us reaching out as a group. So four things that I hope will be helpful. Number one, I hope we can build in our church families a culture of inviting and hospitality. And again, as people are trying to dissect uh, American culture and try to figure out where our open doors in our post-Christian or whatever, more secular, whatever you want to call it, culture, um, one of the open doors people see is inviting and hospitality. Uh, every study that's been done with people who are not Christians have found that non-Christians would visit a church if they are invited by someone they know personally. And that makes sense. That makes sense to me. That, you know, we don't trust people easily. And so, you know, you can, you can do a lot of mass uh, invitations, and we do things like, you know, sending out house-to-house -house magazine in the neighborhood and, and try to do some online stuff and all that. But most of the time, the people who will visit are those who have some sort of personal connection. Uh, Tom Rayner did a study years ago. It's in the book called The Unchurched Next Door. And he's going through different types of unbelievers and how some are more against Christianity and some are more open to it. But one of his big research takeaways was that more than 80% of unbelievers across all types said they would visit a church if two things happened. If they were invited by someone they know and if that person would walk in the front door with them. And the second one's the one I thought was interesting. All right, so not just invited by someone I know, but I guess there's something intimidating. I guess that makes sense. It might be intimidating to walk into a church building by yourself when you don't really, you're not with your person. So that makes sense. So, so he recommends things like, hey, I'll pick you up and we'll go to church together. Or I'll meet you in the parking lot and we'll walk in the front door together. 80% uh, of people said they would come. A more recent survey, 2019, a guy named Rick Richardson wrote a book called You Found Me. And he's not part of Church of Christ. He, he's studying the broader a religious spectrum, but asking these same questions. And he found the numbers sort of lower, but still significant. Uh, he found that 51% said they would come if a Christian friend invited them. 55% said they would come if they were invited by family. So an open door in our culture is inviting, is inviting people to come to worship services, to uh, to family days. And that's that's one thing we want to encourage in our congregations. Okay, if this is an open door, to our culture, then let's try to have some things that give people opportunities to invite. Let's have family days and vacation Bible schools and um, trunk or treats if you do that sort of thing. Uh, we, have a, we have a family or a homecoming rather every five years at Great Oaks. That's been a really good inviting thing. And different churches have different cultures and different things work better for them to invite to and, not, and all that. Uh, but let's try to have an event. That makes sense to me. If this is an open door in our culture, let's have inviting events. And, and then the second one, <laughs> uh, hospitality, a culture of inviting and hospitality. In that Rick Richardson book um, that I mentioned, uh, again, he's studying unbelievers and, and churches who grew by conversions. So not churches that just grew you know, by people moving from church to church, but churches that grew by conversions. And he found the number one predictive factor for growing by conversions is if you have a church family that welcomes the unchurched with kindness and hospitality. 
In, in other words, if anybody can walk in our buildings and be treated with kindness and, and good to meet you and where you're from, whether, they're, whether they've got tattoos down their arms, whether they're dressed like the preacher's dressed or not, uh, whether, whether, they've, uh, whether they smell like everyone else smells, or drugs or whatever, you know, whatever, if they can be treated with kindness, anybody walks in your building to be treated with kindness and love, he said that is a, the number one predictive factor that your church family will grow by conversions. That's interesting to me. So let's try to encourage that in our church families. Let's try to model that in our church families, that we're going to greet everyone who walks in the door with hospitality uh, and with kindness, because that, and again, that's a Christ-like thing, isn't it? That's not just a guy talking on a survey. That's, that's Jesus who, who meets people where they are and encourages them to come closer to him. One more element on hospitality here. Uh, oh, and I forgot to bring this slide up. Sorry. So inviting is an open door in our culture. Most conversions come through relationships. Um, and then let's show hospitality in our assemblies. Let's also try, show, try to show hospitality in our worship. What, now, what do I mean by that? Um, there's a guy that uh, you may know the name Tim Keller. He just recently passed away. He's got a Presbyterian background. Um, we would disagree on some things, but uh, he's, he's very good. He was very good at untangling our culture and speaking to our culture sort of in a C.S. Lewis type of way. And one of the things he always said was, we want to try to speak in our, in our assemblies as if unbelievers are listening, because they are. <laughs> and, and so uh, I had a teacher at Freed Hartman in, in the graduate program, Clyde Woods, um, if you know Clyde Woods. And one thing I appreciated about him is as he discussed things he agreed with and disagreed with, he said it in such a way that if someone who disagreed with him was sitting in the back corner, they would not be offended at the way he described it. And that always, that always appreciated that. I always thought, he's not being a jerk about this. Like, he's just explaining, here's what some people say, but here's what I think the Bible says. Just very kindly, you know, trying to explain. Uh, sometimes preachers will say things like, you know, from the outside of Christianity, you may think this, but from the inside, here's what God is doing there. That, that is speaking as if unbelievers are listening. Because you're going to have people there who, who don't all know the same things. And so, especially in our culture, you know, more and more that's going to be the case that people don't know the Bible stories. And it's going to make less and less sense for us as preachers, for example, to say things like, oh, you know the story. We don't know, people, don't know, people don't know the story. Sometimes people who went to church their whole life don't know the story. Uh, and so we we got we to gotta just make sure we're explaining things. In fact, that was true in the Bible, 1 Corinthians 14. And this context is about speaking in tongues, but I, I just want us to notice some things that I think still connect to us. He says that the whole church comes together and everybody's speaking in tongues, which they did in, in the apostles' day and time. And if unbelievers enter, will they not say that you're mad? So they had, they had unbelievers coming in their worship services also. And Paul says, just be aware of that. Be aware that there are unbelievers listening. If, and if everybody's just speaking in tongues in their day and time, they're going to walk away saying you're crazy. But he says, if, if you're prophesying, people are giving the word of God, and an unbeliever or ungifted man enters... He's convicted by that. He's called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and he can fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. So if you will speak in your assemblies in ways that unbelievers can hear the word of God in a way that makes sense to them, they may well become Christians, Paul says. And that makes sense. Uh, and so we want to... Now, I, I want to point out one more thing about this passage, and we'll go to our second thing. Um, he does not say here, focus your assemblies entirely on unbelievers. You know, that's not what, this is not like a make everything seeker sensitive. That's not what's going on here. So it's, he's not saying make your worship services um, seeker focused, but he's saying make them seeker, like where you understand there's seekers there. So you're, you're sensitive to that, but you're not changing things just to, you know, make people like you or whatever else. I hope you see the distinction I'm trying to make there. We don't make everything about unbelievers but we do want to make sure that what we're doing um, is explained and, and uh, presented in such a way that unbelievers are listening. So number one, big thing we want to try to produce, as I understand it, in our church cultures is a culture of inviting and hospitality. Number two, we want to try to produce a culture of doing good, both in the church and in the community. That same Rick Richardson book, uh, you Found Me. Now he says one big obstacle to becoming an outreach-oriented church, and, and I'll explain what this means if it's not clear at first. 
he says, is rejecting the dichotomy between compassion and communication of the faith. Here's what he means. He feels like a lot of churches feel like they have to choose between being a church that preaches the gospel or a church that helps people. And his point, and I think he's right here, we shouldn't have to choose between being a church that preaches the gospel and a church that helps people. But, but he says sometimes churches struggle with that. He says sometimes churches feel like, well, we can't do anything to help people unless, we, unless there is a gospel presentation alongside it. And if you can find a good, effective, natural way to do that, that's great. Go for it. Um, but it's okay sometimes to help people just because you love people. Uh, Jesus is a great example of that, isn't he? Um, Jesus, a lot of times when he heals people, he has faith conversations with them right there. But sometimes he waits for, the, for a later time. Uh, in Luke chapter 17, he heals 10 lepers. He says, go show yourself to the priest. One comes back and then, then there's a faith conversation. In John chapter 9, he heals the blind man. Doesn't say anything to him about faith, just heals him. Turns him loose. It's later when the, when the guy comes back. Then they have a faith conversation. And so it's okay to, have, to just try to use wisdom and say, uh, it's okay to help people uh, without right then and there a presentation of faith, but I want to keep my eyes open for chances to speak. I'm not ignoring the gospel. I'm keeping my eyes open for chances to speak. But if we will try to do good, both in the church and the community, there, there's a multiplying effect of people seeing the gospel live in us. Galatians 6.10 is the verse that reminds us of that. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially to those who are of the household of the faith. So we especially want to take care of our fellow Christians. We want to make sure we're, we're serving one another. But we also we want to do good to all people. All, all people, whether they're Christians or not, whether they're open to the gospel or not. Uh, let me share a few quick things that may help us just brainstorm how we can try to create a culture of doing good. Um, first of all, maybe just pay attention to all the good things that are already happening in your congregation. Uh, a lot of churches are doing great things, doing good things that are helping people, and don't always take the time just to celebrate it, just to say, hey, this is a really good thing we're doing here. Uh, you, you ladies have been have been serving these, these ladies in the nursing home for 10 years, and that, that's just amazing, the service you've shown. Just celebrate the things that are already going on. Um, second, maybe just reflect on your community. What are some open doors in our community to do good things? If you have teachers in your, in your congregation, maybe it's an opportunity to adopt a school that they work at and, and maybe give gifts or, or treats to the teachers during testing week or something. Uh, find a way to, to give school supplies for the kids or, or some clothing for the kids that might need some clothing as the school year starts. Your teachers can help you know what's needed. If you have nurses at your congregation, sometimes hospitals are a little more difficult on this than schools are. But if you have nurses, maybe they can connect you with something similar. And, you know, is there a way we can encourage the nurses that you work with? We know it's a stressful job. We know there's a lot going on. Can we give treats in the break room or something? You know, from, from Great Oaks Church of Christ, we love you and appreciate you. Is there a way to, to reach out to first responders and just say we love you? Drop off some cookies at the fire station or something. Just, just look around your community. What are some ways to do good uh, in the name of Jesus Christ? Uh, a, another little thing here, try to do things in a relational way if possible. If there's a way to do something consistently enough where you can build relationships with people, to me that seems like the best way to do good in the community, where they can get to know you over time. Um, and if it's through your teachers, your nurses, boy, that's great. You already got that relationship connection. Um, but if you can do something relational, that's better. It's not bad to, to go and drop things off for the local pantry. We do that some too. But, and, but there's not, it's not as much relationship. You know, you'd like to be able to get to know, to know people if possible as you go along the way. Um, number four on these quick little points, put forth the effort so you can serve without enabling people. I know a lot of churches can get really burned out with what we call benevolence programs, people who show up and ask for help, and you want to help them because God loves them and you do too, but how do you do that without feeling like you're getting lied to all the time or whatever? I'd, I'd encourage you to just take some time and just try to set up what do we help with and what do we not. Um, and at Great Oaks, somewhere along the way, we decided uh, we've got a food pantry, we've got a clothing closet, and that's what we do. And then we have a list of other local places that we can point you toward if you want more than that. Now, if it's our people or someone our people know, you know we, we'll do a whole lot more because we, you know, we know the relationships. We know what's going on there. Um, but if someone just calls with that relationship, hey, here's what we do. We're glad to help you, and we can point you in other directions. 
Um, I also put down here, try to get ideas from other churches, but don't burn yourself out. <laughs> so there's always, I mean, there's always a million things you can do and things that other people are doing that maybe you can't. Um, and then I also put grade yourself correctly. You know, don't, don't say to yourself, well, we've been taking cookies to the fire station for five years and not a single baptism has come out of it. You're doing good. You're doing good things. And what I, what I think we found um, in, in, at Great Oaks and other churches as well is when you're doing good things, um, evangelism doesn't always come through those things directly. Like it's not always the, the fellow teacher at school that ends up having a conversation about faith, but it, but it often comes indirectly. You know, for example, our members become more evangelistic as they're part of these outreach events in the community. They begin thinking more about evangelism. Um, and it also comes in directly because people who visit uh, see that this church really loves people. Do you have a hand up? Go ahead. Yeah, maybe so. Yeah. To, to leverage it into evangelism. Yeah, maybe so. And, and it, it might even be more natural than that. You know, it, it ends up leveraging into evangelism. But you do it because you love people, right? You're like, the, you know, the motives are, are sincere, but it produces evangelism. And so, yeah, I like that idea that it, it ends up producing evangelism, whether through the people who are part of it um, or even people who visit that see that. Go ahead. One of the things that they do at Concord Road that I found most amazing, especially during COVID, because it was the only place that it was happening in person. Okay. And that is we have a group that we call the Late Lunch Club. Okay. And it's the, uh, one of the local AA groups. And okay. we make our building available for one of the classrooms available for them to meet every single day. That's really good. At 1 o'clock. And um, it has made a huge impact, especially hmm. since so many places they couldn't meet in person. And that was very important to meet in person. And it gives also the ladies an opportunity, especially the Tuesday morning ladies class, that we provide snacks once a week for them on Tuesdays. And they really appreciate that. And it's amazing how many cards they send, you know, and how much inroads that has. That's really good. Because this is the only contact they have with us. That's great. That's a great idea. That's really great. And so y'all have relationships now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That I love it. I love it. And, and people will see that y'all love people. You know, from that happening. Yeah, Karin, go ahead. I love it. That's great. Anything else? Good thoughts, guys. Good thoughts. Thanks for stopping me to give a chance to, to give good thoughts. So a culture of inviting hospitality, a culture of doing good both in the church and outside the church. Number three, a culture where everyone contributes to Christ's mission, where everyone contributes. Um, the goal being, it's not just the preacher, it's not just a, a few people, but God has given his mission to his church. So if you look at the Great Commission, um, a lot of good thoughts already today that I've heard on this. Another one to add to it, all the, the verbs and participles here are plural. Uh, in other words, Jesus is not just giving this to one person. He is giving this to his church. Um, if we were to put a, a southern thing on it, I guess you would say, you all go and make and you all make disciples. Uh, you all are baptizing them. You all teach them to observe all that I commanded you. And I'm with you. Again, this is a plural you. We don't have a plural you in the English language. It's the same both ways, but in the Greek, that is a plural you. This is a, this is a plural passage given to the whole church. 
Uh, if you want further evidence that it's given to the whole church, he says, to the end of the age, I'm with you to the end of the age. So this is looking to all followers who would come. And he also says, make disciples of all the nations. That's something no one person is going to do. Not even Paul did that. Did he? Every, you have to make a disciple of every single nation or you haven't obeyed that verse. That's, that's, that's not just a verse for you. That is a verse for us. Jesus has given his whole church. I want you to, as you go, make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. Well, anything we do as a church, we have different talents, don't we? We have different personalities. God has brought them all together. Uh, Romans 12, 4 through 6 gives one example of that. He says, just as we have many members in one body and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. He gives, and then he gives some examples. Uh, this is not the only place in the New Testament. Uh, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians chapter 4, two other examples of the church is a body and we do different things as, as we all do the thing the church is supposed to do. Uh, worship, for example. Worship is something we all do as a church. There are different talents and different roles that all go into worship. Um, my understanding, and you'll find this a lot in evangelism writings these days, is that evangelism has a similar idea, that it's not just the one person doing everything. Um, you know, sometimes people say, well, I'm not Paul. Like, that's just not who I am. Or maybe you know someone in your life that you think of as a great evangelist. Maybe they're outgoing, everybody they talk to, they're, they're hugging and talking about their faith, and they just have a way to look at someone and say, you know, you ought to get back into church. And they say, you know, you're right, I, I do need to get back in church. Or, you know, you need to be baptized. You know, you're right, I do. You're like, man, I, I, I'm not that person. How, does that, how do you do that? I'm not Paul, I'm not that person. Um, one of the most helpful things that I have seen, I think a lot of people have seen, is the concept of evangelism personalities. You can see I put here Mark Middleberg books. Um, this is something worth preaching. I know we got some preachers in here. This is something worth preaching. Give Middleberg credit. Uh, this is not original to me. Uh, give Middleberg credit. It's the right thing to do. But it's helpful to people because what he does is he points out how even in the New Testament, there are different roles that people are fulfilling as the church reaches out together and how you need all of them. You need them all doing uh, different things. Uh, so here are his six evangelism personalities. There is Peter, who has a very direct approach. Um, Peter's always the one who spoke up first, whether it's good or bad. He's the one who spoke up first. Uh, Peter was the perfect one to stand up on the day of Pentecost and say, Jesus died and rose again. You all killed him. Now he's Lord in Christ. Like that, that was him. That was his personality. It, it fit Peter perfectly. Uh, Peter was the one who could stand before the Sanhedrin and say, we're not going to be quiet. Like, we know what we've seen and heard. We're not going to be quiet. Uh, there's Paul, who's very intellectual. You know, Paul's the, he's got the best education of his day. <laughs> At some point, someone realized, hey, this guy's got promise. Let's send him to Jerusalem. He studies under Gamaliel. Uh, he, he's, he's the perfect one to go into Athens and talk and quote their own prophets <laughs> and say, let me explain to you uh, why what you believe is really found in God, in the real God. The, the real God who sent His Son, Jesus Christ. He's the perfect one to have those conversations. Uh, we need people who can be direct, like Peter. If that's your personality, we need you to be able to have those, those direct conversations with people. Maybe you have the ability to, to just talk to people openly and honestly and say, hey, you need to get back into church. What, what's going on? Hey, why haven't you become a Christian? Have you thought about it? Um, we need people like Paul who are willing to get into the Here's why we believe the Bible's from God. Here's why we believe in God. We have a skeptical culture that always has questions about Christianity. But there's others in the New Testament. He points out there's Matthew, uh, who in Luke chapter 5, after Jesus calls him, you remember Matthew invites, I believe Luke's wording is, he has a reception for Jesus at his house. And there's tax collectors there. And there's sinners there. Well, of course there are, because Matthew was a tax collector. And so he, he's invited them all to his house, and they're just getting to know Jesus. It's a relationship approach. Some people are really good at building relationships. Um, we're in a, being in Memphis, we're in a big city, and Memphis is not a, a growing area, but, but there's the ins and outs of the city. I imagine here is very similar. And so you have people visiting all the time from all sorts of different backgrounds. And some of our most important outreach people are people like Matthew, who just get to know people who walk in the door who can just really get to connect with people who sit near them in worship services, who don't have another connection. Um, Matthew was good at that. 
uh, the blind man in John chapter 9, he just tells what God has done in his life. By the way, Paul did that a whole lot also, just telling how Jesus Christ had turned, turned his life around. If you remember, the Pharisees want to debate the blind man in John 9. Uh, this guy's a sinner. We know he's a sinner. Give glory to God. And he says very simply, here's what I know. I could not see, and I met Jesus, and now I can see. <laughs> that, that's all I know. I don't know if he's a sinner or not. But So he, he had a story. Like he, he knew what he had seen. And in our culture, that's accepted. You know, people don't always want to hear the Peter approach in our culture. But if, you have, if you're talking to a friend or coworker or neighbor, and you can explain uh, the impact Jesus has had on your life, they'll, people listen to that. When you can say, man, I, I went through cancer treatments, and God, would, God gave me the strength to get through it. My church family was great. They're with me along the whole thing. Like people listen to that. When, 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 there's, when you can see what God has done in you, um, do that. We need those people in evangelism. In uh, number five, in John chapter four, the Samaritan woman, she simply invites. She doesn't go back to Samaria after she met Jesus at the well. She doesn't just go back in and start debating people on religion. She just says, hey, I met a guy. Come, come see him. <laughs> come meet him. And that's something that happened in John 1 also, where Philip goes to Nathaniel. And he says, I think I found the Messiah. Uh, it's Jesus of Nazareth. And you remember Nathaniel says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip says, come see. He doesn't start debating. Well, actually, you know, back in Micah, that's, that's how he does. He says, just come see. Come see for yourself. And again, this is an open door in our culture to invite. And so we need people who are good at inviting. Some people are good at that, at bringing friends and letting them meet everybody. And then one more of, of Middleburg's list that he usually uses. Uh, Dorcas's service approach. Uh, remember Dorcas or Tabitha was her uh, was her other name. Um, people had Greek names and Hebrew names a lot in those days. Um, in Acts chapter nine, they bring Peter in to see Dorcas because she had passed. It said she had always been full of good deeds. We need people who love people, who are good at showing love, who are delivering meals, who are who are sending cards, who are wrapping their arms around people, going through all sorts of things. And when we're all doing our thing, that's what people will say, and I think it's very biblical. When we're all doing our thing, whatever your personality is, it, it helps the church reach out as a group. It's not just one person knocking down every domino in someone's life by themselves. It is the church helping people come to Jesus Christ. And that is a, to me, that's a powerful concept. Um, by the way, the, the book I first saw this in is called Becoming a Contagious Christian. If you want to get that and just sort of see more of what he says. Um, and then Middleburg just wrote another book called Contagious Christianity, maybe? Contagious something. I think it's Contagious Christianity. I should have written it down. I don't think I did. Um, but I think Mark Middleburg does a really good job with that. Let me pause. Anything you want to say about, about this one, about each member helping evangelism through their own unique talents? Go ahead. I think, you know, I've heard plenty of people say, I don't know if you have, I can do this, but I think we Listen to that to number two way too much. Hmm. Um, it's a good thought. And if you've ever been on a fishing trip, you know, you're like, we, we have a call list of the names now. And it's like, we're going to have this meeting, a man who loves God and loves Jesus, and is great at sharing. You know, it's like, no, now we need a PhD, not literally, but we, we lifted those people up on pedestals and put ourselves down low and said, no, no, they need to do it because they're better at it than I am. That's a really good thought. Very seldom does God ever call a man to evangelize and tell him to fix it. He never does. That's a really good thought. I may make a sermon out of that. I love it. <laughs> that's that's good. Yeah, yeah. We think the people who have all the answers; those are the evangelists. Yeah, <laughs> he's writing one down now. Oh yeah, the the people who have all the answers; those are the good evangelists. They thought through every question, and you, and there's nothing you can say that they don't have a response. That's 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 not what you see. I mean, you got you got all this stuff going on. It's okay to say. Uh, it's okay to say. You know, I don't, I don't know. Let me think about that, and we'll have another conversation. Yeah, we think we've got to knock down every domino in one conversation, and then we're done. Um, great thought. Anything else on that one? We've got five minutes left, they tell me. Um, number four. Number four. Oh, did I miss somebody? Somebody else have a hand up? Okay. Number four. A culture that keeps the evangelistic temperature high. I put that in quotes. That's a term you see in evangelism writings. Uh, from the last decade or so, 
Um, evangelistic temperature simply means we're all thinking about evangelism. That, that's what I think conferences like this do. They help us think about it more. They, they help us raise our evangelistic temperature. So as we go back out into our lives, we're thinking more. We're, we're wondering what we can do in our conversations and our lives uh, to, to be part of this more. Uh, what do you do to keep the evangelistic temperature high? Well, first of all, I'll put up here Romans 1, 15 and 16, just to show that, I mean, this is Paul, isn't it? Paul, Paul's evangelistic temperature, it, it's always what he's thinking about. For my part, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So some ways um, that you'll find in writings and then just some other thoughts on some ways to keep the evangelistic temperature high. Set a high spiritual tone. Let's just make sure in our churches we're making it clear we're here trying to follow Jesus Christ. We're not just here to have fun, though we hope we have fun together. We're not just here to serve the community, though we do hope we serve the community. We're here to try to follow Jesus Christ. And when you just set a high spiritual tone, uh, when people are looking to follow God, they, they, they appreciate that. And that's what I think people want when they have honest hearts. So let's try to set a high spiritual tone. Uh, they encourage us preachers to try to preach some sort of evangelistic theme six to eight times a year just to keep people thinking about it. You know, people believe in the Bible. They want to follow the Bible. Um, and it doesn't always have to be go evangelize as the theme of that lesson. It could be about the blessings of salvation. Uh, it could be about... Jesus' conversation with the woman at the well or Paul's sermon in Acts 17. Like, There's different ways you can have an evangelistic theme or a salvation-focused theme. It can be about baptism, why we believe baptism is important. Um, but you wanna, we want to try to keep bringing these themes up so that people are thinking about our mission in Jesus Christ. Uh, those of us in any sort of leadership role of any sense at church, um, try to model soul-focused activities. Let's try to be the ones meeting people who are coming in who aren't part of the church family. Let's, let's greet people. Let's try to be the ones who are, who are uh, asking if, if non-Christians want to go get coffee and, and talk about life, and then asking if they'd like to start sitting down for a Bible study. Like, let's try to model these things as much as we can. Um, again, helping evangelism be part of our church family. <coughs> Excuse me. Have regular outreach events. Uh, there's one congregation from here in Middle Tennessee that, Years ago, they told me they have a group that every year um, did a door-knocking gospel meeting just helping out congregations around the country. They would go find a small congregation. I guess they still do this. And one person told me, they said, nothing has shaped the culture of our church more than that annual trip, to just go knock doors and have a gospel meeting. Like There was just something about every year we're going to serve God and encourage people to become Christians that people came back excited about evangelism uh, and in my home congregation where I grew up in Murfreesboro, we did a, a mission trip to Jamaica every year. I think they go a different place now, but, but that did similar things for me. I came back thinking more about evangelism. And so have regular outreach events um, where, where we're trying to reach out. And I heard one guy suggest maybe every five years have a big outreach event in your community. You know, maybe invite somebody from Apologetics Press to come in and talk about why we believe in God and just really try to reach out to the community, invite people, something like that. Uh, have some sort of regular evangelism training, maybe a, a class on evangelism every couple years, or maybe even more than that. Uh, maybe if you have a group that would like to get together on Tuesday nights to really dig in even more and challenge each other even more, you could do that. Give the church resources. Uh, if there's some sort of maybe set up like a conversations table in your lobby where, where you have some resources, or tracks or whatever else, if someone has the chance to have a Bible study, maybe there's some material they could use for a Bible study with someone uh, in, their, in their life that they have a chance to have and make sure people know that's there. And then celebrate baptisms and steps of faith. When people are baptized, don't let that just be a small line item on page three of your bulletin but beneath the, the food pantry needs for the week or whatever. Like, let's, let's, be, let's be excited about that. That's what God's most excited about. Let, let's celebrate um, the step that's been taken of faith. And so those are some of my suggestions. You may have even better ones to try to keep the evangelistic temperature high. Anything you want to say about that? All right, I appreciate your thoughts today. I, I hope all of us will continue to try to grow in our effectiveness as personal evangelists, but there is a multiplying effect when we can try to build a culture that a church alongside us 
that is thinking about evangelism. Here's the suggestions I've had today. Uh, you may have 12 others that are even better, uh, but I hope these are helpful. Let's pray real quick and I'll let you go. God, thank you so much for the gospel. Thank you for the way it's changed our lives. God, I pray that we can shine our lights for you. I pray that you'll open doors for us. Lord, please help our church families to become cultures of evangelism where people see you living in us and that they want to follow you as well. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Appreciate your thoughts today.